This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, we've uh, tried to tape two sessions on overcoming spiritual entropy, and our mic system messed it up. And what's interesting is that I taught it in 2010, and Google has decided to make sure that no one can find it, even if they call it up by its exact name. Uh, but we will be returning to that sometime in November. I want to give you guys a break so that it will sound brand new. <laughs> Here in a few months, I don't know he's doing it again. But as I prayed this morning, God began giving me a prophetic word for where we are, and I'm actually going to tie in somewhat to the podcast that Mary and I did this week. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. And I call this a prophetic word for this season. I am perplexed by what I see going on in the body of Christ all across the internet all around the world, the things that I am hearing, things have got to change. It is bringing reproach upon the name of Jesus for those that are on the outside looking in. And heaven is about had it with what's going on. And you see, I want, the, I want God to judge the devil. The Bible says if believers will judge themselves, then we don't have to be judged by anybody else. And it's time that we have that. Starting in verse 11, it's in Romans chapter 13. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake up out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And if that was ever true in the body of Christ, it's true right now. We are seeing, the, we are seeing end time prophecy unfold at an accelerated rate while most of the church is ignoring end time prophecy because it does not fit into their mega church plans. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now he's telling that to the church, which meant the church was still having on the works of darkness. They were immature, they were not growing up, they were backbiting each other, and Paul called all of that works of darkness. Armor of light does not conduct itself that way. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in rivalry and drunkenness and lewdness or lust or in strife and envy. Underline that in your Bibles, in strife and envy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Now, <laughs> all the things the Apostle Paul lists here in verse 13 are symptoms of spiritual slumber in the body of Christ. When you are spiritually asleep, you begin responding out of the flesh, and religious spirits love to use that. When I see, uh, I saw a meme the other day. That had you ever watched, you know, the WWF wrestling or whatever they call it now, WWE, where it is pandemonium that all the players are in the ring and they're fighting and punching and flipping one another and throwing them out. 
And this guy says, this is what it looks like on social media when somebody shares their understanding of Scripture on Facebook. (laughs) It has gotten ridiculous that now we do our fighting in the open and are pursuing one another over petty, carnal things. If we major on the majors and minor on the minors... My, wouldn't life be better? But I see the stuff that's going on, and it's breaking my heart. When I look at the Hebraic Roots movement, I sit and just scratch my head. You see, I've been a part of it for a long time, but I have colleagues, scholars, that have been a part of it for decades all their lives. I've, I've, got, I've got friends in their 70s that this was the way they grew up, that they had a proper balanced understanding. And this year, a good friend of mine, Dr. John Garr, are calling scholars from all over the world, and the subject of this colloquium is what in the world do we do with the Hebraic moves movement, and then how then shall we live? Because is it Sabbath? Is it a sun Sabbath, moon Sabbath? Or is it seven days a week, but we lost track? And so, so do we really know that Saturday Saturday? Let me tell you something. God in His divine hand has kept it that way. And even when Russia tried to create, tried to go against God's creation and create a 10-day week, people lost their minds over it. <laughs> this, is, this is a creation concept. That humanity, whether they want to recognize it or not, there are seven days a week, and Sabbath has always been Sabbath. And no, the, the months are not out of alignment, and this is out of alignment. We can, and I, I've got friends in Israel that I, I can bounce things off of and say, is there ever in the history of Israel from the very beginning, has Israel ever observed a lunar Sabbath? You know what I got back? Mike, what are you talking about? And these are scholars. That's news to me. Nowhere in our history. It's been from sunset to sunset. And we can date it all the way back to Abraham, if not before. And but man, you have these people get on and they'll knock out each other. No, no, today's not Wednesday. It's the Sabbath because the moon this and the moon, moon that. The only thing the moon does is show us when a biblical month begins. Not the day of the week. And yet, our flat earth, our, our sacred name, is it Yah- Yahuwah? Is it Yahweh? I remember the old joke about the guy that was trying to figure out if it was Yahweh or Yahweh. And he spent all the money he had fighting the greatest rabbi on the planet, was up on a high mountain. So he had to scale the mountain and gave him his last bit of money as a gift. And he said, Rabbi, I need to know, is it Yahweh? Is it Yahweh? And he says, son, of course, it's Yahweh. He said, oh, thank you, Rabbi. You've helped me so much. You're welcome. (laughs) And we can fight till the cows come home about how to say the tetragrammaton, but when you take it, and it's literal meaning when you look at it letter for letter, it literally says, the God with the nailed hand shall be revealed twice. In fact, it's encoded into the Psalms that Yahweh has become my Yeshua. So literally, when you say the name of Jesus or Yeshua, you have said it all. And when we get to heaven, when we cry out, Father, when all this garbled mess because of the Tower of Babel, we have transcended that because we now are in heaven. I mean, no, there's no confusion in heaven. There's no separation of languages. It's all Hebrew in heaven. And when we cry out, Father you're going to find out exactly how to say the sacred name because it's going to come out of your own mouth. Come on now. But yet we have all these fights. And we're like a bunch of kids fighting in the playground as the enemy assembles his armies. And they're not messing around. Let me tell you something. They don't get out of rank because they will kill their people that get out of rank. And we use the grace of God to puff up the flesh. We use the grace of God to yield to religious spirits. And religious spirits are running amok. I found it because I was raised Baptist, okay? 
I find it in the Baptist church. I find it in the charismatic church. I find it in the Assemblies of God church. I find it in the Hebraic heritage. I can't find a, a place right now where religious spirits are not running amok because people will not crucify the flesh and understand the time and season that we're in and that God is requiring us to be grown up in the kingdom and no longer being children. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about here. You know, over the years, I have heard everything that can be told by ministers and congregants alike. I was shared this one story of how on Sunday morning, this pastor, he quit. He couldn't take it anymore. A friend of mine, Brandon Gallup, didn't know, and he was called in to do a revival starting Monday night. Didn't know anything was going on. I just love it when somebody's led by the Holy Spirit. And he begins calling for people that had been wounded by Christians to the altar. Half the congregation came up, and right in the middle of them was that pastor. That they all confessed the other half of the congregation was eating them alive. And then the other half of the congregation was called to repentance and were found around the altar. But we need to have words like that again. How many preacher's kids have rebelled against the church because they were hurt by members of the church? Come on. How many pastors walk away? When I was growing up, I had a good friend named Jeff, and his dad was a Baptist pastor of a very affluent church. And I mean, it was a, you know, back then it was way before, I'm showing my age, way before the mega church movement, to where if you had like five or 600, that was a big church, okay? Brilliant guy. Or he could organize stuff like nobody's business. He was a gifted leader. And he got tired of being bitten constantly by the sheep and the goats in the pasture. And a corporation came and said, why are you putting up with this? We can put you in leadership in our corporation. You can really use your organizational skills. And oh, by the way, it's like three or four times the salary. How many know there was a sonic boom as that pastor was packing up his stuff to go work for the corporate world? Ted Brewer did the same thing when he began sharing with them how to eat and how to get healthy. He was mocked by the body of Christ. The corporate world were paying him $5,000 a pop for a seminar for what he was trying to give away to the body of Christ, and they rejected it. This stuff has got to stop, guys. In the previous verses here in Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 8, O oh, no man anything except to love one another, for he who loves another hath fulfilled the law. For the commandments, ye shall not commit adultery, ye shall not murder. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, even on Facebook. That's the new modern translation. And therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, in this, the first mention of fulfillment of the law is pleru, the exact same word that Jesus used. He said, don't think that I've come to do away with the law, but to, to fulfill it, which means to cause it to abound. When people can understand it, they can do it. The rabbis were making it so complicated, it required a PhD in quantum physics to be able to understand what they were teaching. The second time, fulfillment of the law is pleroma, which is a variant of that same word, and it paints a picture of a ship, the law as a ship, and by how we conduct ourselves in walking in love, we fill that ship full of meaning. You know, it's not a ghost ship, it's not an empty ship, it's not a derelict. It's one filled with sailors and goods so that when they pull up into a harbor, there is great rejoicing. They didn't have UPS bet trucks back then. What brought them food and medicine and spices, and I don't know about you, but I like spices with food, and all these wonderful things they had to ship from one part of the world to another. When that ship came in, the community rejoiced. That's the word that the Apostle Paul was using when we walk in love we make the commandments of God when they come. It's like that ship loaded down with blessings. But the way the lot of the body of Christ is living today, we have made the word and the commandments an empty, derelict ship. 
Guys, that has got to change. I mean, we're getting to the place where we need to have God's special forces doing ministry, and we're still all acting like we're in kindergarten. That's got to, that's got to change. There is, a di- there is a spiritual dynamic that is going on right now. It's changing. One of the things that I have learned about the occult is they're adaptive. Now, the body of Christ will get stuck in a rut, And they'll march around in that rut until it gets 40 feet deep. And they will fight over getting out of the rut because we have done it this way for 100 years. Come on now. And we're not adaptive. We do the same old things that we used to do that are no longer working and we expect different results. The enemy is constantly adapting. The deep state is adapting to 2016. We are in a tsunami of occult power right now in America because it is there to divide the body of Christ. It's there to take away our power. They do not want 2016 to ever happen again, regardless of which side their candidate is on. They want to own that candidate, whether it's Republican or Democrat. They want to own them, not try to hold them back and try to find a bit that fits in them that they can pull them back and rein them back. They want them to be their willing puppet which they've had for quite a while. I think they've had it ever since Kennedy was assassinated. And so we're in this tsunami of occult power. If you have any spiritual discernment, if you've been in public, it is like being in a beehive. People, that's one of the reasons we've been warning people, you need to start praying, all of a sudden we start having mass shootings. Now I think the difference in the one that we just recently could have had in the Ozarks is there's been a lot of prayer go on. So the guy had 100 rounds of ammunition. He had an AK-47 or whatever it was. He had an assault weapon. Walked into a Walmart grocery store and said that he was protesting them not selling ammunition. You can't get ammunition at a grocery store. It doesn't line up. But what does line up is what the enemy was preparing to trigger. Prayer stopped. And how many know that God had that off-duty firefighter that was ex-military pull out his weapon and say, it's time to hit your knees. You're not doing anything here while I'm here. It was prayer that put him in that right position. It was prayer that had him bring his weapon that day. And that man simply yielded to instruction. We need to understand the enemy will adapt. That's why we need to continually hear from the Spirit of God. You may have went always left in everything that you have done before and it worked great and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, boy, today you better turn right. I'll tell you what, you better turn right on that day because the Holy Spirit knows more of what's there than you do. And you have cut a rut in going left every single time and the enemy knows what you do. And you've got to throw them off guard. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, this is a word in season right now. Peter writes, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. The way to go forward in the kingdom is through humility. Humble yourselves. Now, what does a religious spirit do? A religious spirit lifts itself up by putting others down. But that's one of the things I, I so appreciate with the conferences that I'm going to right now. Everybody associated with those conferences are lifting up the other people that are preaching. I don't know if you saw it on camera down in in Branson, but as I was coming up to the stage, Carl Gollops got up and ran to me and hugged me. And what he whispered in my ears, go get them. (laughs) And I fought back tears because I've seen things in the past similar to this. And if you preach too well, there's, there's this jealousy that goes on. I've not seen it in, in the Hear the Watchman. I've not seen it in these others. But boy, I've had, had Christians email me and try to stir it up. 
Well, Michael Heiser says this, and, and he says a different position. You, I don't mean to cause trouble. What do you think about it? Well, God bless him. That's okay. He probably looks at me every once in a while and rolls his eyes and prays for me, you know. Not going to argue. Either he's right and I'm off, or I'm right and he's off, and if we're praying, God will adjust. Come on. God's big enough. Or maybe this guy's just blowing smoke and just trying to start a fight. But when you walk humbly, I had a couple of people ask me down at the conference if I was Dr. Michael Heiser, and I had to say no, but I could actually feel my IQ kind of go up just a little bit because they thought I was, you know. A brilliant man. I, I love his works. I, I, I respect what he does. I respect what all of them do. And, and to see the grace that's on their lives. You see, that's the way it should be in the body of Christ. I'm at where I'm at right now by the grace of God. It was nothing that I have done. It was nothing that Mary has done. It's what God is doing. And we'll keep on this track as long as we hold on to Jesus with all of our hearts. When we start getting off, when anybody starts thinking, boy, the body of Christ is blessed that I'm in the body. Pride cometh before the what? The downfall. And I don't have to have people criticize my preaching. I do enough of that as I'm editing it. I hate to edit video because I'm my biggest critic. Well, you shouldn't have scratched your nose. You should have said this this way. Why did you blink right here? Okay, I don't need anybody else to do that for me. I almost have a migraine by the time I finish editing. Oh, it's time to send it. Thank God. <laughs> well, I'm waiting for one of my grandsons to get old enough, maybe do it for me or somebody else. But we got to stay humble. The only way to be exalted in the kingdom of God or for God to raise you up to use you is in direct proportion that you learn to be humble before Him. I've heard myself preach without the anointing. We all just need to go home if that ever happens. Mary will say, that's right. But it's the anointing. Never confuse the man or woman with the anointing. They are two different things. You know, you don't hug the UPS man when he brings you something somebody sent you. You want to go down and find the, the loved one that sent you a precious gift, and you hug them, not the UPS man. But why do we do that in the body of Christ? That's a whole other subject. We're not rock stars. If we're humble servants, because I have learned the lesson. I read the Bible. We ha actually had a donkey give a better prophetic word than the prophet that was riding on his back. You know, sometimes I'm proof God can still use donkeys. We need to humble ourselves. Secondly, he says, cast all our care upon him because he cares for you. No matter the situation, now listen to this. No matter as you're learning to grow, you're going to mess up. Been there, done that? You're trying, you get in the flesh, or you think you had it figured out, and you're kind of like that toddler that they're sitting there and their tongue's kind of hanging out to the left, you know? All right, I'm, I'm going to get this thing. And they take about four steps and they thought they had it figured out until the left foot started getting caught on something else. And many times we walk like that. Now, as a parent, do you, set, do you go there and whoop them and chew them out because they didn't have it all figured out? Do you pick them up, love them, and encourage them? That's what God does because we're all in a growth cycle. Every single one of us. Even Moses at 120. And God said, it's time to go home. And he says, oh God, I've, yeah, I've just begun seeing your glory. In other words, uh, there's still more of you to learn. There's more of you to, to, more to do. There's more to grow. That should be the way it is for every one of us to the day that we close our eyes in death. We want to grow more. We want to know him more. We want to understand more of the kingdom. But we can cast our cares on him. I've gone, to, I've gone to the Lord sometimes in my life. Lord, please, for, I, I messed up. I tell you what, somehow or another, I tied my own spiritual shoestrings together. And when I went to run, I bent my nose so far it was almost sticking in my ear. 
And God, you know, God is so gentle. I've, I've had him tell me, I know, Mike, I've been waiting for you to come so that I can straighten out your nose and to heal your boo-boos and to show you where you messed up. I was just sitting there waiting how long you were going to pout about it before you came to me and said, I need help. Am I, am I singing somebody else's song this morning? I can cast, he cares, he wants us to grow. He doesn't want us to get caught up in the flesh. He doesn't want us to go back to old cycles of, of carnality that do nothing but bring in the enemy and strip us of any true spirituality. He wants us to grow more than we want to grow. And boy, we got to understand that. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The one who's stealing from you isn't Jesus. It's the devil and his whole kingdom. He's active stealing. And what Jesus is trying to do is help you get your doors and windows locked and that security system on so that he can begin filling your life full of the treasures of heaven. But he warns us. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your, enemy, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I've seen some charismatics make fun of this scripture. The devil had his teeth pulled out. No, he hasn't. You cannot find that anywhere in Scripture. That word devour does not mean gum to death. I know Mary one time she was saying, she, she was listening to that, you know, there, there was one song that, that all he can do is meow because he's had his teeth pulled out. Mary said, if that's the truth, I'm getting gum. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans, as the powers of Mystery Babylon gathered to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the son of perdition's return. Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com that's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.